Good morning, Harmony Grove. Hey, glad you are here um, this week. Last week we had our annual missions conference. Um, hopefully you were blessed by that. Um, missions conference kind of starts off missions month in our church. Um, in your bulletin is Faith Promise. I'll be reminding you of that probably of every week. Uh, faith Promise is how we set our missions budget. Um, we do it by faith. We do it on uh, promised giving. Um, so as you pray and seek the Lord and, and how you want to support missions in our church, um, please get those slips in. They are due um, Sunday, November 3rd, and then afterwards we'll work on the budget and go from there. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, maybe we'll, I'll get a couple other people to give you uh, testimonies about Faith Promise and do some other announcements. Coming up in our church tonight, we have youth group um, start at sixth grade. Um, they'll meet upstairs in the fellowship hall, 6.30 to 8 um, this week, um, Wednesday night. There is no Awana, no prayer meeting, no little explorers. Um, this week is our second annual trunk or treat. Um, if you are part of the committee, we'll have a meeting after church today to review everything. If you're bringing something in, some candy or some of the other items, um, hopefully you brought it in today. We could use that stuff. There's a box in the back. Um, if you are participating, there are still cards that you can invite people. Um, we have, I think, 15 cards. We'd like 20. Um, so if you are interested in that, we have these awesome kits. So we'll, we'll help design a car from you. By the way, you can have this one. This is a sports theme one. It says God's team. If you sign up for one of these, by the way, they're in the back by the mailboxes. Um, but we probably have another 10, 15 of these uh, kits that you can uh, sign up for. Um, if you are designing a car or, or giving out candy, um, two things. One, you can start lining up about 5.30. We're going to be out back here. Chunk or Treat starts at 6.30. Um, two, uh, bring a bag of candy to start out. We'll have some additional candy. Um, we don't want to run out of candy, but um, if you can bring a bag to start, that would be great. Again, Chunk or Treat is this Wednesday. Um, last year, we had over 100 kids um, come. Um, we hope it grows this year as well. If you have any questions or uh, about Chunk or Treat, you can see myself or Tiffany Landry. Um, again, and if you want to sign up for a car, uh, if you need a kit, um, there's a sign-up sheet on the Welcome Center. I believe that is all of our announcements. Everything else you need to know is in the life of, excuse me, in the life of the church is in the bulletin. I'm going to ask Charlotte to come up and pray. We'll begin singing in a moment. Let's pray as we focus our hearts for worship this morning. Dear Jesus, we thank you that we can come before you today. Lord, we pray that you will settle our hearts, that you will give us focus, that we can sing your praises, study your word, and be challenged by your word this morning in order to go forth this week. Lord, we pray for those who will uh, come to the trunk or treat on Wednesday night. We pray that all of us here will invite kids to come, that they can enjoy this outreach, but also have opportunities to hear about you. Lord, we just pray that um, you'll bless us today, help us have some sweet fellowship today as well, and just teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand as you are able as we begin with your great name.
turn in your Bibles, if you want, to Matthew chapter 12. Uh, I'll begin reading in verse 38. It's page uh, 558 in the Bibles in the pew there. So Matthew 12, beginning at verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son, sorry, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with these generations and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. And then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Please stand as you are able as we continue with All the Way My Savior Leads Me.
One of our favorite shows is America's Got Talent. A couple weeks ago, season 19 wrapped up. Yes, they're still doing it after season 19. I guess America has some talent. And if you're unfamiliar with it, um, it is a reality show where contestants come, they audition, they go through various rounds in hopes of winning both a million dollar grand prize or $25,000 a year for 20 years and a residency in Las Vegas. So if my clicker is working, ah, oh yes, these are some of the contestants uh, that made it to the finale. Um, one of the things we love in the show isn't actually the finale, it's actually the progress through the show. You, you see contestants who to us are unknown, they come, they do their act, and the judges with the crowd's help passes them through or not. And then they go through an elimination round, a quarterfinal, a semifinal, and a final. You, you see them five different times throughout the show. And one of the refrains you'll hear from the judges is that each round you got to step it up. Because there's only one winner, so how do you make your act bigger or more exciting? How do you do something harder or more complicated or in some cases even more dangerous? Because what got you through the audition round isn't going to get you through the quarterfinals, isn't going to win you the show. And often, one of the things that gets contestants eliminated is their inability to step it up. They've kind of seen the same thing over and over and over again. And the judges want something that's going to wow them and, and become even more impressive. Because ultimately, they're going to have a residency in Las Vegas, and they're, they're trying to put their best act um, in that position. So how do you step it up? Question for us as we think about spiritual things, and maybe you never thought about it this way, how do we step up our faith? How do we take our faith to the next level? How do we have a faith that's just not a Sunday morning faith, but is real in the rest of our life? Uh, the idea you're going to see this morning is that Jesus isn't here just to entertain us, but rather to lead us. And maybe the way we step up our faith is we yield our heart, we allow Jesus to lead every, every area of our life. We're going to pray, and then we're going to go through our Bible study, finishing up Matthew 12 this morning. So, Father, um, here we are. Um, as we sang a, a few minutes ago, our desire is to surrender and to surrender all of our life to you to yield the throne of our heart. God, that we just don't come on a Sunday morning, that we're just not here for the show, but Lord, we want you to be real and powerful and lead in our life. In Jesus we pray, amen. Again, if you're not um, there already, um, we are in Matthew chapter 12 going to finish Matthew 12 this morning. We have three points as we go through. First word says the word then. This is kind of the, the cultivation of, a, of an interesting chapter. Chapter 12 begins with Jesus doing these miracles on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees are, are so angry that they conspire to kill Jesus by any means necessary. They start to get organized. They start to plan out how they can get rid of Jesus. And the rest of the chapter is the series of uh, tests, the series that is trying to trip up Jesus. We weren't here. We were here last week at missions conference, but two weeks ago, they bring Jesus like this impossible guy to heal. He's demon possessed. He's blind. He's mute. And the idea is like, yeah, this guy will get Jesus. And, and Jesus heals him like that. And then the Pharisees see, oh, he's tricking you. This is Beelzebub. He heals this guy because he's really the prince of demons. And Jesus kind of goes through three reasons why that's crazy. A divided kingdom can't stand. Why would Satan fight against Satan? This week, their attempt to get Jesus... Is the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, they answer Jesus saying, Teacher, we want a sign from you. 
not just any sign. We want the sign. We want a miracle above all miracles. You've done all these other things, and that's nice. That's, that's good audition round type stuff, but we want to step it up. Can you take it to another level? And what they're really saying is, Jesus, you're the contestant, and we're the judges, and we want you to wow us. We want you to impress us. Give us a sign. Now, we're at the end of Matthew 12, and if you've been following along up until this point, Jesus has done 19 miracles up to this point. About 60% of all the miracles he's going to do, he's done. He's healed lepers. He's made the lame to walk. He's made the blind to see. He's cast out demon-possessed people. He even rose Jerry's his daughter, from the dead. So 19 different miracles. And above that, twice, it says he heals people all night. So when he healed Peter's mother-in-law, word got out, and they just kept bringing people to Jesus all night long. And it says that Jesus healed them all. So you have 19 different miracles, and we have these two sections where he does a whole bunch. We don't even know how many miracles he does on those occasions. But the Pharisees are saying, hey, all those things are great. Those are good. Can you step it up? Can you do something that's really going to wow us? And Jesus, he's not here to entertain us, but he's here to lead us. So Jesus' response to the Pharisees is no. Well, not no, but it's no in a different way. Before we get to that, if we think about it, what's wrong with this, this type of attitude? It shows that they're just here for the show, not here for the Savior. And by the way, sometimes we do this too, don't we? We, we can look back in our lives and we can see, hey, Jesus, you've done this and you've done this and you've done this. You've answered these prayers. You've worked in miraculous ways in our life. And yet sometimes how do we pray to Jesus? You have an illness. You, you have a, an issue. You have a problem. How many times do you pray, Jesus, just open up the heavens and reach down and do something miraculous? Look. If you're praying for healing, it's a miracle if Jesus hear, hears by a miracle or hears by medicine. Either way, we're healed, right? It's true, isn't it? How many of you ever pray that Jesus would use the medicine? How many of you pray that Jesus would give the miracle? And sometimes he does. And sometimes he doesn't. But either way, he's still Lord. He's still our leader. And we have to learn to be content however Jesus answers and however Jesus leads. So the Pharisees are saying, hey, Jesus, keep doing bigger, keep doing more, keep doing greater. And, and Jesus isn't here to be on a stage to be our entertainer. No, no, Jesus is here to be our leader. So Jesus gives a little bit of a direct response. He doesn't answer a question with a question which he often does. He says this evil and adulterous generation. Spiritually, they're adulterous. They're chasing after the things of the world opposed to the things of God. And he says, no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah is this small book in the Old Testament, four chapters. You could probably read it in 10 or 15 minutes. Jonah is a prophet of Israel, and God says to Jonah, go to the wicked Nineveh people. Go to the east and preach. And Jonah says, I ain't doing that. So instead of going east, he goes west and tries to sail as far away from Nineveh as possible. And God sends a storm to get a hold of Jonah, and eventually Jonah picks himself up, realizes he's going to cause everyone to die, and he jumps into the water. And if you know the story, what happens when he jumps into the water? A big old fish, maybe a whale, catches him. I always wonder, does he catch Jonah mid-air, or does Jonah sink and he catches him? We don't know. We, you, can, you can Hollywood that one up in your own mind. 
But when he jumps out the boat, everybody thinks he's good as dead going into the storm. And when he gets swallowed by the fish, everybody thinks he's good as dead in the belly of the fish. But in chapter 2, God gets a hold of his heart. And three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, good as dead, the fish spits him back out. And I always wonder, does he spit him back out on the land? I always, I wonder if it's like a rock. You ever skip a rock with your grandkids and they skip across the water? I wonder if his bum just skips across the water and we digress. Um, you don't think about this too? Am I the only one who thinks about these things? Maybe. Maybe. And he goes to Nineveh and he preaches, and we'll get into that in a moment. But no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. And this is the sign that's given, right? That Jesus is going to go to the cross, he's going to die, he's going to actually be dead. It's a greater miracle. He's going to be in the tomb for three days, and on the third day he rises from the dead. The greatest miracle is still the one to come, that Jesus actually is going to step it up. And he pays for our sins, and it's by his stripes we are healed. Amen? So it's interesting. He does give them the miracle, just not in the way they're expecting, and not in the time frame they were expecting. The men of Nineveh will rise up against judgment and judgment in this generation. We'll come back to in a second and condemn it because they repented of the preaching of Jonah. Indeed, one greater than Jonah is here. Earlier in chapter 12, one greater than the temple is here. The temple points you to God. Jesus is God. One greater than Jonah is here because Jesus is going to die and rise again. And in the next paragraph, one greater than Solomon is here. That the, the people of Nineveh, they're going to rise up in judgment against you. So Jonah, after he gets spit out and skipped across the water, he goes to Nineveh and he preaches. And if you go through chapter 3, Jonah literally preaches eight words. If you look at it, Jonah says eight words. They see Jonah, and with eight words, the entire city repents. And they're changed, and God spared them. And none of us are going to look down and go, whoops, sorry about that. Great moments in preaching. None of us are going to say, hey, we got a prophet with four chapters, and we got eight words and we change. Look, you got the Savior. And up until this point, you got the Sermon on the Mount. You've got 19 miracles. He's walked up with you. And what is your attitude to seeing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? You're acting with contempt. You're, you're, instead of yielding, instead of repenting, instead of changing, you're saying, hey, Jesus, entertain us some more. Give us a greater miracle. Do something that's really going to wow us. And again, the irony of it all is he's going to do just that. Because even though he's condemned and he's buried, on the third day Jesus is going to rise again. And he's going to walk among them and they're going to see their Savior. And you know what? Are they going to yield? No, because they just want the entertainment. They don't want Jesus to lead them. So, when I dropped this clicker, it advanced. One greater than Solomon. Verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment against this generation. Again, condemn it. Same words as Nineveh. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear from Solomon, and one greater than Solomon is here. Again, the Pharisees were, were the book smart people of this day. And if you read through the story of Solomon, uh, Solomon is gr giving greater, great wisdom. God asks Solomon, what do you want? And, and Solomon says, hey, make me wise. Allow me to lead your people. And God responds, hey, because you didn't respond with wanting a long life or wanting riches, I'm going to give you all these things. And people from around the world would come and ask Solomon questions, like the, the queen of the south. And what Jesus is saying, look, 
The Son of God is right in front of you. You've heard the Sermon on the Mount. You, you've heard the teachings of Jesus. You've heard the words of God, and you didn't repent. You, you showed up. You, you got the entertainment, but you now never allowed Jesus to lead your life. Two more points as we go through. Remember, this isn't written in 2024 or even in the, the olden ages as the 1900s, as my kids would say. I mean, 1900s doesn't seem that long ago, does it? Yeah, my daughter's like, yeah, that's the Stone Ages before the Internet. Like, oh, my goodness, how did people survive? Uh, this was written in the first century. And, and Jesus gives these illustrations, and some of them a little bit more clear to the people he's talking to than to us today. We're going to get into the next chapter. He's going to give, like, farming illustrations. Uh, again, some of those are more clear to others. I'm a city kid. Uh, this one isn't the clearest especially in 2024, but I'm going to read through it. And I'm going to give you the understanding of, of what Jesus is trying to say. He says in verse 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes in the dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And he comes and finds it empty, swept, put in order. Then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So it will be with this wicked generation. All right. So let's, let's just take it simple and we'll go deeper. So this man has a, an unclean spirit. He's, he's demon-possessed. And God heals him. And by the way, when God heals him, we would say, praise the Lord, right? We would be thankful that, that someone who, um, in that state, is healed. So, so God heals him of being demon-possessed. And yet, what this illustration is trying to say, instead of trusting in the things of God, he trusts in the things of man. He trusts in his work. He, he does his best to get his house in order, to, to do the things um, that our world would say you need to do to get your life right. And by the way, our world is, is full of these things, right? Nod your head if you know someone who is an alcoholic or, or is on drugs or has some kind of addiction. And when we tell people who have addictions, hey, you just got to try harder. You just got to you know, get your life together. If you try, you try, you try, you can beat this. And what often happens to people in those situations? It probably works for a season, and then they stop trying, and what happens? How many of you have ever known someone to jump off the wagon? Right? Hey, they were doing so good, and they missed a couple meetings, and, and bam. By the way, I could give you illustrations from my family. I'm assuming some of you can as well. And what happens is often when they crash and they burn, they... They're a lot off, worse off than they were in the beginning. This guy, God heals them, and instead of trusting the things of God, instead of letting Jesus lead his life, he's just there for what Jesus can do and not what Jesus can be. And, you know, he eventually falls off, and seven demons come and indwell him the second time. And you know what happens? He's a lot worse off than he was in the beginning. And so it is with this wicked and perverse generation, right? And what he's saying to this generation is, look, you want the things of God, you don't want God. You want what God can do, you don't want to yield your heart to God. So you're seeing the power of God in front of you. You're seeing Jesus heal and, and, and Jesus teach. And instead of yielding your heart and trusting in Jesus and allowing him to lead your life, you're saying, oh, well, Jesus, that was great what you did last week, but can you do something even bigger and better? And I'll keep showing up as long as you keep entertaining. And by the way, sometimes that's what happens with people in church, right? When, when church is no longer entertaining them and, and the show isn't getting bigger and bigger, We've all known people that grew up in church but are no longer in church, right? Because Jesus isn't here to entertain us. Jesus is here to lead us. And we need to yield our hearts to the things of Jesus. So, 
In the midst of all this, we get one more scene. So while he was talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. And you might be asking yourself, well, why now? Why, in the midst of everything that's happened, why are his mom and his siblings showing up for a visit? Mark gives a, a little bit more um, clarity on this. Again, two weeks ago, um, Jesus heals that unhealable man, and, and they accuse Jesus of being Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Uh, Mark 3 adds this, um, but when his own people heard about this, that he went out and laid hold of him, for they said, he, Jesus, is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he is Beelzebub, he is the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So word gets back to Nazareth, his hometown. Word gets back to his, his folks. Hey, Jesus is going crazy. Jesus has taken this religious thing way too far. You, you, you all, you, maybe you got to come up here and talk some sense into Jesus because Jesus is confronting the, the scribes, he's confronting the Pharisees, he's preaching and, and he's going way too far with all this. He's crazy, he's out of his mind. Put it in modern context for you. Sometimes we have this principle. Nod your head if you've ever heard this one. Everything in moderation. Nod your head if you've heard this. And it does work in some areas. For example, Ice cream is good. My daughter is not, yes, I, got a, I did not get a single praise the Lord. Uh, but ice cream, you get a, a little ice cream cone after a meal, that's a nice treat, isn't it? If you have ice cream every night, okay. I could, I could get on board with that at some point. But if you had ice cream for every meal, you would say that is... That's kind of gross, isn't it? That's too much. A little bit of ice cream is good. Having a treat every once in a while is great. Having ice cream at every single meal, that is unhealthy. Everything in moderation. Hey, exercise is good. Again, no praise the Lord on that one. But moderation, right? You're not going to go from being a couch potato to running a marathon. There's a gradual buildup. And some people have this idea with faith. That faith is good as long as it's in moderation. Hey, if you want to come to church on Sunday, that's good. If you want to be religious for that hour of the week, that's good. Uh, but you know what, just, just do it in moderation. Just have a little bit of Jesus, and then you can leave, and you can do whatever you want. But really, that's not the story of Jesus. And Jesus says, you want to come, to, you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow after me. You try to chase the things of the world, you'll lose it, because you should be chasing after the things of God. Then one said to him in verse 47, Look, Mom, your brothers are here. They're standing outside. They want to speak with you. And he answers, Well, who's my mom and, and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand and said to his disciples, Here are my mom and brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, he is my brother, my sister, my mother. Again, in perspective, Jesus is talking to the, the Jews, the Israelites. And they thought being part of God's family was a birthright. That they were born a Jew. They were children of Abraham. Of course, they're part of God's family. And Jesus says, no, no, no. My true family aren't people who were born into it. I mean, let's be honest. Some of you were born into this church family, right? Right? 
Sophia, you've been here just about every single Sunday of your life. You were born into this church family. I look around, some of you can nod your head, yes, you were, maybe some of you were not necessarily born into this church family, but some of you were kind of born into a church family, right? I mean, nod your head if you've basically grown up your whole life going to church. Yeah, there's a number of you going, yeah, you know what? Mom got out of the hospital, three weeks old, I was in church, right? Some of you are like, yeah, you know what? After church, mom changed me over on that side pew. Going to church doesn't make you part of God's family. Being part of God's family is not a birthright. Jesus says, whoever does the will of the Father, those are my brothers. Those are my sisters. That, that's, my mom. that's my family. Look, we all get into God's eternal family the same way. God so loved you, he sent his son. That if you would believe in Jesus, you don't have to perish. You can have everlasting life. Right? You don't get to heaven by being good. You have to put your trust in Jesus as your Savior. And, and putting your trust in Jesus as your Savior, the, the idea of repentance is an all-in type thing. You were living for the world. You were doing your own thing. It was getting you where it was getting you. And you realize you're butting your head against the wall. You're going to turn around. You're going to live for the things of God. And you start that by putting your trust in Jesus. That Jesus, and these stories aren't just good stories, and, and Jesus just was a moral teacher. And this isn't just about entertaining you for a half hour, or I guess the whole service is about an hour on a Sunday morning. That's not why we are here. Faith in God isn't like putting your toe in the deep end. No, no, no. True faith is like cannonballing into the pool. You are all in. And this is the type of obedience that God expects from every one of us. So they said, hey, give us a sign. Step it up. But that's not what faith is, right? It's allowing Jesus to sit on the throne of your heart and be the leader of your life life you know what's coming next now that you've heard it what do we do with it and the first thing you need to do if you're not part of God's forever family you need to become part of God's forever family we would say that this is an exclusive thing that Jesus is the only way he's the truth of life no one gets to the father no one gets to heaven except through faith in Jesus Some of you believe we're, we're living in the last days. And Jesus hopefully is coming soon. And Jesus may come again or, or we may breathe our last, but at some point we're all going to stand before God. We're all going to give an account. The only people who get into heaven as part of God's family are those who put their trust in Jesus. If you've never done that, bow your head in your own words, pray Put your trust in Jesus as your Savior. We started by saying, how do we step up our faith? Right? How do we take our faith to the next level? Some of you, where is Jesus calling you to trust him today? Jesus, uh, faith and folly hath God, it's not a Sunday morning thing, it's not an entertainment thing, it's an all-in thing. You know, is there an area of your life God is calling you to yield? If there's an area of your life where God is calling you to trust Him, is there an area of your life that God is calling you to step out in faith? Is there an area of your life God is calling you to greater obedience? And, and whatever that is, you know, in the quietness of your heart, you, you can hear God speaking to you, Delayed obedience is disobedience. If you're up in Sunday school, this is kind of the, the idea of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He's doing things on his own time frame. It's, it's delayed obedience. It's really not true obedience. Where is God calling you to true obedience this morning? God, we thank you for your good. You formed us, and you know us, and you love us. 
God, help us not just to come here and, and, and think this hour is enough. God, help us to yield the throne of our heart, to trust you, especially when it's hard, in all our ways acknowledge you, and Lord, you will direct our paths. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hey, let's stand and sing Trust and Obey. They pray for us Wednesday night. We have our trunk or treat. We, it's a great outreach of our church. Um, so as you go through the week, please be praying for us. If you can participate in some way, um, you can still donate some candy. We could use a few more cars. Um, we just want to make this the best way to reach our community as we can. So again, pray, and if you can, help. Father, we trust you. Lord, we yield the throne of our heart to you. God, help us to step up in greater obedience, in greater love, in greater joy for you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.